Hello, welcome back. We're having another video lecture uh, on this is April uh, 18th for Business Ethics, three, Philosophy 360. Um, hello again to everyone in the chat. Thanks for being here. Appreciate that as always. And hello to you on YouTube, people watching it later on. Um, the agenda for tonight is to really get going with the first of our big three um, theories. Um, plus one, which I'll talk about a little bit, the, the little plus one thing uh, as we get going here. But we're going to talk about the main one, utilitarianism. Um, when I asked my uh, 260, the, the open enrollment other section of business ethics I'm teaching this quarter, when I asked them earlier today if anyone had been doing any of the optional readings, everyone said no. Uh, so maybe that's happening with our class too. I don't know. But um, I do recommend checking out uh, all of those... Um, optional readings kind of as we're going through them um, and reading you know what you can of them in the emails I've sent out before I've made some recommendations about like where to start so if you like don't have a lot of time to look at these things um, I've recommended certain parts of them to take a look at but I think some primary source contact as a supplement to my lectures would definitely not hurt I, I mean you're gonna get a lot of the core ideas from me Hopefully, I'm good at lecturing on these things and explaining them. Um, but one of the reasons why I always, um, even for like a crash course thing like this, I want students to take a look at primary sources is because I don't want you to just take my word for it. Um, I think it's helpful to kind of think for yourself about it and to get it straight from the horse's mouth. Um, not to say that these uh, three philosophers we're going to be really diving into, John Stuart Mill, Immanuel Kant, and Aristotle are like the end-all and be-all of these theories because and I actually have some comments on that about not obsessing too much about the people involved here um, those works are really rich and uh, my summary is only going to be a summary and personally I've been pretty dissatisfied sometimes with secondary summaries and explanations of these theories um, like videos on YouTube or even other professors who have taught me um, that I, I think there's some pretty common misconceptions about it and I don't think I've got the final say on all this stuff too so it's always good to think for yourself when I went through the text on on my own as a student of them I found points at which I disagreed with the way in which they were presented that I thought those presentations were inaccurate and, that, and you might feel that way about it with me too so I'm always like Go and think for yourself about it too. Read for yourself. Um, so I think that's always good. Uh, at the very end of our, before I get into this though, I, I have a lot of preliminaries before we get into utilitarianism directly. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get a nice big bite out of uh, that material tonight in the two hours we've got here. Um, but I, I also uh, wanted to start before getting into that with a little bit of a recap from what I was talking about at the end of class on Tuesday. So at the very end of class, in like really just the last little gasp of our time together, I um, was presenting a distinction between three different forms of normative judgments. So kind of going back to the, the, the first distinction here that there's, um, we make claims, we say things are true, and they come into two kind of categories, descriptive claims and normative claims. And descriptive claims are all about what is the case? What state of affairs obtain in the world? What are the circumstances that apply? Um, everything that science does and studies is on the descriptive side. It's just trying to understand how the world is. Normativity is all about how the world ought to be. It's evaluative. Um, it's about what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, what's appropriate and inappropriate, all that kind of stuff. So um, what I'm trying to do is break down that categorization a in a little bit more detail, that within the normative half of things, there's also different types of judgments that happen there. They're all in the business of evaluation, but they're evaluating different things in different dimensions. And the philosophers and the philosophies that we're about to take a look at, these ethical theories, are going to make comments about all three of these categories of judgment. But one thing that I've found from experience teaching it is that, like, like I actually came up with this distinction prompted by teaching the material and recognizing that students were sometimes in danger of confusing some of these judgments with each other. 
And I, I think just having the distinctions defined and tracking that these are different types of judgments, that they have a, a different logical shape to them, helps resist that temptation to confuse them with each other or have some of them bleed into others. And I also mentioned, uh, I think when I was talking about this on class on Tuesday, that part of the reason why um, I think this is also especially helpful has to do with the concern around judgmentalism. So when we make judgments of each other and ourselves, uh, there is this kind of danger in morality of of being judgmental. At, le at least I would say, I, here, i got to get my hat on here. I would say that I think judgmentalism is something uh, that can poison our ability to participate in the realm of morality in a way that's healthy, respectful, etc. Um, and when we're being judgmental, I think that attaches to uh, only some of these judgments and not others, um, or at least the distinction between these three can help to understand how even with the stuff that people are judgmental about, that sometimes take it in that bad direction, there's something there that is important to talk about, and it's not like the judgments themselves are the problem, but rather what we're doing with them. So um, let me go back through that distinction between those three uh, types of normative judgments, and again try to um, piece together, connect the dots here about why I'm concerned about it. So the three, the three types... And these are, again, non-exhaustive. There are other normative judgments that don't fall into these three categories. Um, the most famous one here being aesthetic judgment, uh, judgments about beauty. We're not going to talk about that in almost at all. <laughs> Maybe we'll touch on it a couple times uh, in this class. But ethics is not really about aesthetics, um, not primarily. A couple philosophers I'm actually thinking of who like really want to link them, and I'm iffy on that. But it's, it's a little fringe thing to do that. But there also might be some others here. <clears throat> I'm not making any claim like these are the only forms of normative judgment. But these are the three types that are most relevant for moral and ethical reasoning and, and theorizing. So the first one um, is, well, I think I did it in one order last time. Let me, let me do it in the reverse order this time. One of them I was calling moral worth. And if we're making a judgment about whether someone or something has moral worth, we're making a judgment about whether it's deserving of care and concern. So is it a kind of thing that is like an end that morality is concerned about? Uh, if any of you have taken a look at um, Mill, the Mill reading, he talks about means and ends. And every single one of these philosophers is going to talk about means and ends. But en ultimate ends would be like the main purpose of life. That's why ethics is actually the meaning of life question just maybe not in the format in which you're used to thinking about meaning of life or something. But ethics is really about ends. It's about what we should be pursuing. And that might be people. People could be um, an end. Now, what sort of way are we concerned about people is another question. But um, whether something is deserving of care and concern is what would it mean for it to have moral worth. So... Uh, the environment I and mean, it doesn't have to be a person it could be like the environment if there's a position in philosophy called deep ecology and deep ecology believes that um, the environment is something intrinsically valuable that it's worth caring about for its own sake not like we need to care about the environment so that humans can continue to live on this planet kind of thing that would be a concern about people and so we're concerned about the environment just because of our concern for people but deep ecology is saying, like, actually, the Earth is a proper object of value itself. It, it, it has moral worth. It is deserving of care and concern intrinsically to itself. And that's what we think, um, that's the same kind of theme here, is when we think of people being worth our time or worth our care and concern. Um, it doesn't make any judgment on, about them in any other dimension other than that they are worthy of care and concern. I think I might have mentioned in class on Tuesday egalitarianism. And egalitarianism is just the position that everyone has moral worth and has it equally. So there's no conditions put on it. It's not like only certain people are people that we ought to care about. Uh, everyone is worthy of care. Or like Mill's going to talk about later on in our lecture tonight, um, Mill's an egalitarian. 
He thinks everyone is equally deserving of happiness, like on a fundamental level. Everyone deserves to be happy. Um, every, we, it's not like some people are more deserving of being happy than others or anything like that. And it's a pretty strong statement to say that. Egalitarianism is much more ubiquitous in our world today in the 21st century than it was centuries ago, certainly before the Enlightenment. Um, but once the Enlightenment came around, uh, egalitarianism started to become a bigger, more common ideal, and an ideal that was starting to shape governments and society and ethics more broadly, not just like a couple philosophers who are like, oh, I got this radical idea. Uh, but, you know, for most of human history, egalitarianism has not been the default mode of operating. It's been more like us versus them, tribalism, um, some kind of divisions in which some people are being acknowledged as having moral worth and other people are not, or not to the same degree. Like even in American history, some people being treated as three-fifths of a person. That's not egalitarianism, even though in our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, there are a lot of egalitarian sentiments. It wasn't put into practice. Okay, But this is all about the world of considerations of moral worth. People in the chat, definitely keep chiming in if there's questions as I'm going through this and I can help with. Uh, the people on YouTube later will appreciate it. The second category um, that I was talking about was moral status. Oh, I'm sorry, before I get in here. I think when we're worried about judgmentalism, to get back to that thread, when we're worried about judgmentalism, it's really about judgments of people's moral worth. So we're worried, uh, it, like if, if you're like me and concerned about people being judgmental, that they're um, putting conditions on whether someone is deserving of care and concern, like whether they're worth your time, whether they're worth your energy to invest in what's good for them or to respect them or something like that. Um, and a lot of times when we're judgmental, what we're doing is linking moral worth with one of these other two categories. And probably the most common thing that I've heard is in terms of people putting some conditions on moral worth rather than the kind of unconditional nature of egalitarianism where it's like everyone is deserving of care and concern equally no matter what. Um, the most common way of putting a condition would be to link it with the second category and that's a category I call moral status. And moral status is a judgment about someone's uh, relative guilt or innocence uh, of wrongdoing. So basically issues of moral responsibility. What's right and wrong? And if I judge that you are guilty of some immoral conduct, or if I judge that to myself, that's a judgment of moral status. Or if I'm like, no, you weren't responsible for that. You know, you sh there isn't any moral guilt you ought to feel about that. That's also a judgment of moral status. And we're not equal there. I mean, that's that's kind of a, well, there might be some people, eh, maybe even me, who might argue mm, some more hot takes on that. But um, for the most part, it seems like, you know, not all of us are murderers. Not all of us are rapists. Not all of us are liars. Not all of us are cheats. All the, you know, there's different ways in which we morally wrong each other. And those aren't always equal. So our moral status is not always the same. I mean, one of the most uh, common but really silly arguments against egalitarianism is saying, of course people aren't equal, because look at, you know, you're different than Jeffrey Dahmer or something, right? Um, and that's true. Like, we're different in other respects. Egalitarianism isn't saying anything about that, though. It's just talking about equality in terms of people's moral worth, whether they're deserving of care and concern. Um, this second category, we're, definitely there seems to be the possibility of contrast on this that we could be guilty or innocent and that'd be different from one person to another. But what a lot of people do that put a condition on moral worth is they'd say, well, you're deserving of care and concern as long as you're not a horribly immoral person. If you're a piece of shit human being, then we don't need to care or have concern about you anymore. So it's like uh, sometimes people give this kind of argument when they're uh, defending something like death penalty, right? It's like, hey, you shouldn't worry about what goes on with these people anymore. It's not the same as killing an innocent person. We're not violating any moral obligations here because this person's moral status basically means they lose their moral worth. 
So uh, quickest sort of slogan I've heard for this sort of position. I don't agree with this, by the way, but you'll find it out there. And you might even feel I, I always have a lot of students who have this kind of moral intuition. But the basic slogan here would be like uh, you lose your moral rights when you violate other people's moral rights. All right. So um, having moral rights means you're you have moral worth. You're deserving of care and concern. There's rights that other people need to respect uh, about you. But if you violate other people's rights, which is doing something wrong, your moral status is now guilty of wrongdoing, then you lose that. Okay, So you're, in this view, your moral worth is contingent on your moral status. Um, Lauren asks, like judgment cross-culturally about what we believe is right? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, but I'm maybe not exactly sure what you're asking with this. Um, if we make judgments about each other's moral values, if I am like, I think you're living an immoral life, and you're like, well, I think I'm living a moral life, okay? So we, and we come from different cultures or something like that. Um, to just make that judgment that, like, I think your moral values are wrong, or that you're guilty of some moral wrongdoing, even if you don't see it that way, is not to be judgmental. Um, and, uh, doesn't necessarily have anything about um, moral, no, no links here with moral worth. Um, it might actually be out of care for you that I try to give you a moral rebuke. Like, with the, think about the people that you love the most and that love you the most. They're probably the people who are going to tell you if you're doing something wrong. Like, people who don't care about you, if you're living a bad life or something, they might try to seek accountability or protection from you but they're not really that invested in your moral status, um, in which case they're, they're not really kind of caring about you. I think if we think uh, it would be better to be a moral person than to be an evil, immoral person, then if we think someone is worthy of care and concern, that might lead us to share our concerns about their moral conduct. Um, so rebuke is not rejecting a person as no longer being valuable. That's the thing I'm I'm trying to emphasize here. Some people do it that way. That like, if you're immoral, then you're not worth my time or my energy or my effort or my investment. That I, I you're no longer deserving of care and concern. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And and I think a lot of times if people are worried about morality, if you get in the realm of morality, now you're going to be in this world of being judgmental toward other people. It's because people are linking those two things. Kind of like imagining um, if you have a friendship with someone and it, you, ha ha you hang out, you have fun together, there's other ways in which you connect, um, but then you're like, I don't want to necessarily go to having a deep conversation with you because if I find out like your values are really different from mine, that might be a deal breaker for our friendship kind of thing. That would be like putting a condition on whether I see you as someone worth my time, uh, threatening the relationship. I think a similar kind of thing can happen here with, with morality, but it doesn't have to. That's the point. Same way in a relationship. Like, you can be friends with someone and disagree. That can happen. Um, that disagreement might need to be addressed in some way rather than just ignored, not just a like, eh, you say tomato, I say tomato, right? If it's about really substantive things of morality, it's probably going to be important to talk about that. Um, but it doesn't have to mean the end of the relationship. And the talking about it is really to invest in the relationship. It, it, working out a disagreement is takes a lot of investment. It's a sign of care and concern. So am I getting it all at what you're asking, Lauren? I wanted to make sure I, I, I actually was addressing what you were asking because I wasn't exactly sure I understood the question. Sort of. I was just trying to understand another example of moral status and those judgments. Um, okay, so and in some sort of connection here with cross-cultural judgment. Because we were talking about that a lot with... Oh, okay, <laughs> I lost train of thought on that. Okay, um, 
we were talking a lot about cross uh, cultural uh, claims and evaluations with the relativism thing. Um, just as without opening up that whole can of worms again, um, cultures are in some ways like more complicated opinions. Like just how every person has their own moral beliefs, you can have a group of people with a shared belief, shared moral beliefs. Um, and just the same way that um, we were saying last time on Tuesday, like, or I was saying, um, I think it's dangerous to grant this kind of um, arbitrary authority to just whatever you believe, that's your truth kind of thing. I'm worried about that same sort of thing with um, cultures and societies. Then just because a culture says something is right doesn't make it right. Um, just the way that I can be wrong in my moral judgments, we can be wrong in our moral judgments. Um, and I think when people are judgmental, let's say, they're being being judgmental, not just making judgments, judgments are just making claims, but being judgmental, this kind of kind of nasty attitude about people that are from other types of, oh, did we lose connection here? Uh, oop. I don't know what happened there. Can you hear me? Did we lose something? Where did where did uh you lose me? It cut out. When did that happen? Do you remember what I was saying? <laughs> oh no. Maybe something got bumped here. Being judge. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so making a judgment is just making a claim. But this kind of judgmental attitude, if we're um, this particular kind of nasty attitude, uh, if we're being judgmental about people from another culture or just the values of another culture, it might be like um, a kind of it isn't they don't have moral worth. Like it's not worth taking it seriously or taking them seriously. There could be like a disrespect of people that's going on there. And that, that but that doesn't have to happen. Um, cross cultural criticism is actually one of the things that I think well, I should maybe turn my hat for this. I think it's one of the reasons why diversity actually matters. <laughs> like the value of diversity is by it, one of them is by being in contact with a lot of different perspectives to be able to consider other alternatives of what might be correct. That helps you with critically rethinking your own values or your own culture's values. And that's something that is not just for us, but for others too, like people from other cultures, I'd say the same thing for them as well. Um, none of our cultures have this kind of default inability to be wrong kind of thing going on with it. So uh, yeah, I think that's that some kind of space of being able to make judgments about people's uh, values and beliefs, especially and and also in cases where they come from a different culture than than we do, is part of the whole purpose of tolerance and diversity. Um, that's that's my thinking about that. If you want to talk more about it, we can do it, and we will have some opportunities to do that more um, with the rest of the quarter. Um, the final category, though, here of these three is virtue. What I was calling virtue. And judgments of virtue are just judgments about whether someone has good or bad characteristics. And that's logically distinct from whether they have this moral status thing going on, whether they have the characteristic of being guilty or innocent of something. That's a matter of, like, you can't be guilty or innocent of things that you don't have responsibility for. But there's some traits about us that we don't have responsibility for, and we can still talk about whether they're good or bad. We can still normatively evaluate them. Um, but just not loaded with this kind of moral content. So, for example, um, one of my favorite examples would be something like, uh, I think I brought this up in class on Tuesday, having a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. That would be something bad, but it doesn't make a person immoral. right? Just having that tendency is like, you're kind of playing life with a handicap here. Like, now that there, it's, it's uh, unfortunate and tragic that you have to deal with that kind of obstacle toward life. Um, I actually, in my other class on Tuesday, uh, someone uh, wrote, raised their hand in class at the end and, and was like, thank you for that distinction. I mean, she was really interested in it and it was very helpful to her. 
um, because she was um, chemically addicted before she was even born because of her parents. And so uh, she ended up becoming an addict later in life too. And it's like, it's, it's tricky to maybe know exactly where the line is drawn on what's your, what are you responsible for and thus what your moral status depends on versus things that you don't have control over and may just be good or bad characteristics without the moral responsibility thing. Like, what are you responsible for and what you're not? That can be pretty fuzzy sometimes. But there's definitely uh, room here for... There could be things going on with you that you didn't have control over. You didn't decide what parents you were going to have. You didn't decide what culture you were going to be raised in, what social class you were going to be a part of, um, your body, any of those things. There's all those things you don't have decisions about. Uh, and so you cannot be morally evaluated for possessing those characteristics. Now... In as much as there are characteristics you have that you do have agency about, or you do have some responsibility or control or power over, then you can be morally evaluated for those things. But these are still two different judgments. Just what's good and bad is different from what's right and wrong. And that'll actually be very useful when we get into uh, utilitarianism here later tonight, because utilitarianism is a species of consequentialism, and what it is to be a consequentialist is to think that what's right and wrong actually derives from what's good and bad. And so I'll, I'll talk about that more later, um, but that's a little sneak preview here. And another reason why having these three categories well-defined is helpful. So um, chat, let me know, how is it going? We spent about 25 minutes talking about this. Is this feeling a little sharper, a little clearer what the distinctions are than our really quick and dirty treatment from Tuesday? Yes? Okay, cool. If there's any leftover questions, please let me know. Awesome. Okay, okay. Let's keep going, and because um, we have a lot, a lot of things that I want to talk about. I actually have a list of like, oh boy, about a dozen points here. Um, just I wanted to not forget about any of them before we even get into utilitarianism. So um, there's, there's a lot of things um, to talk about in approaching even doing something like ethical theorizing. And, and I've talked about some, some things in this ballpark before in the earlier stuff with like preparing and welcoming you to the class and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's some that are specific for ethical theories themselves. And I think how to approach understanding them, um, what kind of frame of reference to use for how to handle these very strange and very complicated objects, uh, moral theories. Um, so I have a lot of advice here and some tips. I'm probably going to be turning the hat quite a bit. Um, and I, I want to kind of get through them quickly because I'm really eager to get to utilitarianism and, and start actually getting through the, the nuts and bolts of some of these different substantive moral proposals. But I think all of these points here are useful, um, especially if this is something kind of fairly new to you, um, kind of an introduction into, into what's going on. First thing um, I've said before, but I want to emphasize again, is especially during this crash course and for the whole quarter, I really want you to be thinking for yourself. These theories can't tell you what the moral truth is. Um, they can aid you in your own effort to seek that truth. Um, but none of these people are moral authorities in the sense of, well, they said it, so it must be true kind of thing. You just you can't treat them like that. They're not like other types of sources of, say, empirical facts, like if you're doing a research paper or something like that. Um, they, No one can be a moral authority um, other than that they have some good moral ideas, you know, and the, the ideas are the things that have merit and have the weight, not the person who's giving them to you. So uh, definitely think for yourself here. I'm intending for this not to be just like learning and understanding the theories, but chewing on them and thinking like, do I really agree with this? Which parts do I agree with? Which parts do I disagree with? I really want you to keep that um, uh, framework in mind as we go through these. And for anyone who's in the chat or when we get together on classes on Tuesday, uh, jumping into the conversation, if you've got a, a bone to pick with something, bring it up. It's very helpful. Uh, also because I think I might have mentioned this before, but... Um, 
when the when you're thinking about criticism while understanding it, I, I found that when students like voice their complaints and concerns uh, about the moral theories, it actually helps with detecting lots of opportunities for misunderstanding. Um, if any of you have taken a look at the utilitarianism reading and you, you saw how Mill was talking, I mean, right out of the gates, he's like, all you haters, right? I mean, he, he's already sensitive. It's actually one of the reasons I give you his treatment of utilitarianism rather than some others is he's having to fight uphill. He's an underdog in the 19th century for this theory. At this point, utilitarianism is much more ubiquitous than it was when Mill was writing. Um, and it's much more commonly accepted or at least integrated into our moral intuitions and, and into your own conscience, even maybe without you recognizing it. Um, but in Mill's time, it's kind of the new kid on the block and everyone's really suspicious of it. They've got their own moral traditions and consciences that are not tailored toward utilitarianism directly. Uh, and so Mill's, Mill's confronting a lot of early objections to utilitarianism that really aren't understanding what the proposal is or taking it as seriously as it probably deserves. And so um, instead of being afraid of sharing your criticism because you might reveal that you misunderstand something, I actually would be like, please give it. I mean, if, if there's misunderstanding, reveal your ignorance so we can work on it. That's all a part of the process. Learning these theories is very tough. When I first studied these series, oh boy, I came away from those classes with so many misunderstandings, I'm embarrassed to go back and look at my notes about what I was saying about them. Um, so it's, it's a normal part of the process to be confused or to misunderstand. And the best thing that you can do, I think, to get the most out of this unit is to, uh, to step into that evaluation and ask questions and share your concerns. And if there is a misunderstanding, then we get to clear it up. And then you don't have to worry about it. Um, I've met many people who have like, taken a philosophy class and then fancied themselves as being experts on these things when they're running around with a lot of misconceptions and they think, oh yeah, I, I've considered utilitarianism, it's bullshit, here's why. Where it's like, that's not really what it's saying, or it has so many resources for responding to that concern, like, we got to work it out a little bit. Okay, um, the other thing I think I've already mentioned to you, but I just want to remind you, is that these theorists aren't dictating morality. They're not trying to tell you how to live, even though it sounds a lot like that, because they're like, here's what's morally right. Here's the objective moral truth. Boom, I'm giving it to you. They don't think that they are the last word on the subject, and they all respect the gravity of what they're attempting, the audacity of giving a moral theory, how big of a burden of proof they're under. They all respect it greatly, and they are no um, dummies when it comes to things like the diversity of moral opinion. All of them. I mean, okay, I've got a little bit more of an axe to grind about this. Um, I've met some people, sometimes, that uh, seem to have a distorted view of history, uh, from how I can tell. That sort of, it wasn't until maybe even as late as this generation that people finally, like, woke up to the immoral ways in which the world had been operating for untold centuries. And it's just not true. Um, humans have been critically reflecting on morality and their cultures from as far back as the dawn of philosophy. In the ancient world, this is happening. Um, so it's, it's, not, um, it's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, even things like diversity, um, like understanding that there are other cultures out there. Like it didn't take the internet before people realized, oh, sometimes people come from other cultures and they think differently than me. Like that, that wasn't some kind of big awakening that um, has only happened in like the 20th century or something. It's been around for a long time and philosophers have been tracking that and concerned about that um, and trying to even anticipate values and perspectives that don't even exist in a culture um, that are just like theoretical ones because they're interested in not just rationalizing their own culture or something like that. In fact, I, I don't really think many of them are doing that. If anything, they're usually more sort of revolutionary or countercultural. Um, certainly Mill in his time is doing a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that, that these people are modest, even though they're making bold claims, big, bold claims. They recognize that this truth-seeking project is something that we do together. And it's not like they're the ones that see everything clearly and everyone else is a dummy or something like that. That's, that's not the attitude in which they're giving these things. And um, I think we'll see that especially with Mill and Kant and Aristotle, I mean, they're in all in different ways, 
you can see just how deeply they're sensitive to this issue and how much they have to really shoulder the burden of proof to make sure that their suggestions and proposals aren't just loaded with all this projective bias, that they're not just taking what's going on with them personally and projecting it out on all of humanity. I think they're very careful about that. I'll try to point that out as we go through. It'll happen a lot because I'm going to be so concerned about teaching you these theories, not just in terms of what they're proposing, but the arguments about why they think they're right. So what could they appeal to as evidence here? The whys behind the whats is a big priority for me as we go through this unit. Um, the other thing I like to encourage you about here, so uh, just FYI, chat, um, because I got so much stuff to talk about here, I'm going to pick up my little list. Um, I'm just going to be kind of like going real fast, and I really, if there's something coming up, please butt in and ask me a question, or if you have a comment or something, like be lively on the chat. Don't be afraid of jumping in, because I'm just going to keep rolling uh, if left to my own devices, because uh, there's so much I'd like to like to get to here. So you, you help me with slowing down when we need to slow down, or if there's something that I say that's not clear, et cetera, et cetera. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, um, so another piece of advice I have is as you're looking at these theories, I encourage you to not um, approach it from being like, which which of these theories do I want to be a fanboy, fangirl about? Like, which one do I want to be like, plant my flag in my front yard with waving the banner of utilitarianism or Kantian ethics or whatever it is? Um, it's, these aren't all or nothing things. Moral theories are very complex objects. They have lots of moving parts to them. And you can kind of take some pieces here and there from different theories and cobble together something else. The theory, the moral theory I've been working on for years, um, kind of my own philosophical research here, definitely imports elements from lots of different theories. Um, it's not just a matter of defending one. Um, so that's an option. It doesn't have to be all or nothing here. Um, so when you're thinking for yourself here, uh, be if you like one of the theories, try to be thinking about, like, is there anything you got complaints about? If you don't like one of the theories, try to also devote some attention figuring out, you know, what is it about this that I think is is legit. Um, but uh, on the other side of the fence here, um, if you're cobbling things together, doing like a hybrid account or a pluralistic account, uh, kind of like trying to embrace a bunch of them simultaneously, being like, hey, all these things can be right. Um, there are some particular dangers and concerns I'd like to talk about really briefly. Because this can sometimes be a tempting solution. So, definitely seen this in many people in the past. So you got all these different moral theories. They kind of fight like cats and dogs. They, you know, have tension between them. And sometimes people get worked up about it. They're like, no, this side's, this one's right and this one's wrong. The other people are like, no, you're wrong. It's this one that's right and this one that's wrong. And it, you know, there could be like some tension. There can be some conflict there. And sometimes... In the efforts of kind of peacemaking, someone wants to kind of jump in and be like, hey, can't we all get along here? Like, I think all these theories are right. Like, I embrace all of them. No conflict. Right? There's something good about all of these things. Now, that option treated just in a really, like, ham-fisted way of just embracing all of them doesn't really solve any of those problems. Um, it, it's sort of more like ignoring conflict rather than actually addressing it. And, and, but there, I'm not trying to poo-poo on pluralism. Like many of my own theories end up being pluralist. I mean, I even told you, uh, when it comes to religious perspectives, I'm, I'm a Buddhist and a Christian. I identify with both of those. Um, so it's like definitely pluralism is not something I'm an enemy of, but I know partly through being one that there's a lot of hard work that's involved with it that may not be apparent. It's not like we resolve the matter by embracing everything. If anything, that's just the start of a whole lot of work that has to happen. Here's some of the reasons why. First off, I think a lot of times the motivation for pluralism is by trying to gain the advantages of all the various positions that you're embracing. Right? You want to get the best of both worlds. I don't want to. I want to be able to have all the advantages of utilitarianism and Kantian ethics. Maybe let's say. Um, but what can also happen is by embracing both of them, you also inherit the worst of them, the worst of both worlds, not just the best of both worlds, but the worst of both worlds. If this theory has a, is vulnerable to some pretty major objections, then putting it together with another theory, just now you're taking, you, now you've got those burdens of proof, and now you have more burdens of proof. 
So you have lots of burden of proof. So it's not like if you just embrace all the sides that you don't have to deal with their criticisms. Those objections are still present and still demand answers. Um, they still need to be addressed. That's one thing. Second thing is that once you put these theories together, they they have tension. And to just say, eh, I'm going to forget about anything that causes tension, can't do that with moral theories. I mean, so much of the stuff that's the most controversial is also the most important. And to just say, we're just not going to go there on that stuff, can't be, in my view, like morally responsible. We're not respecting the moral phenomenon that we're trying to understand if we just do that. Um, so they're going to rub up against each other. You can't just like say this plus this and be and that's your answer because it's like how do they go together there's tension there there's conflict and you have to figure out how they aren't going to step on each other's toes it's probably going to take if you do pluralism some modifications a little bit to accommodate that um yeah i could talk about this a lot uh but i'm, I'm going to try to keep this snappy and short final danger here if you or not danger but sort of like um burden of proof challenge obstacle for defending and justifying pluralistic or hybrid accounts is that it's also can't the uh, concern could be how is this just like not an ad hoc thing that you're like i have preferences and i like this and i like this and i like that and so i'm just going to put them together in a big moral theory casserole it may taste like crap <laughs> you know it might not be any um vision of the chef of how these flavors are supposed to go together like, you can't just arbitrarily pick and choose which parts you want. There's going to be a question here. If we're going to take this part here, this part here, this part here, is there some vision that, like, glues them together, that holds them together of why we would uh, put them together rather than ending up with some kind of big Frankenstein monster? Um, Kant actually complains about this uh, in his complaints around virtue theory. Uh, when we get to Kant, he's kind of – I'm not going to probably focus on this later, so I might as well talk about it now – He's like, it seems like a lot of virtue theory. It's just people doing, this is my paraphrasing, a kind of greatest hits of stuff they like. And there's not any um, systematicity to like, why are these things supposed to go together? How are they supposed to contribute to each other? Um, that also is something that you'd have to do. Now, personally, I think pluralism is worth the, worth the effort. But it takes a lot of effort. It's not an easy answer, and that's the main point I'm trying to make right now. Okay. All right, I got a, another moral um, metaphor here. Um, that hat's giving me a headache. Um, <clears throat> maybe, well, yeah, I'll leave it for now. We'll see how it goes. I'll need to indicate my own opinions here pretty quickly, probably. Um, but this next part is just like a helpful tip for me. I don't think uh, this is a hat-turning sort of thing because... I think what I'm about to say is not terribly controversial, and most moral philosophers agree with me, even though my way of describing it might be a little idiosyncratic. Um, but when I'm thinking about what are these, uh, kind of going back to this point about how these philosophers aren't dictating the moral truth, that they're they're truth seekers. They're they're trying to just discover it. Um, they don't think that they're automatically right about things, but what they're what they're doing when they put together these moral theories and publish these books and things is they're like. Here's the product of my labor, right? Here, I put all this work trying to figure this out. Here's how it looks like it's adding up to me from doing all this research and reflection and debating and all that kind of stuff. After doing my, my research, which philosophers is, or like the thinker, right? Um, we just research like this a lot. Sometimes we're reading other things and finding stuff out from academic sources, but a lot of philosophical research is like, hmm. Or like talking with people like, what do you think about this idea? I have this idea. What do you think about it? And we just kind of kick it around and debate. And that's that's research. Um, now it sounds a little weird. It is it is very rigorous, though, I would argue. Anyway, I think what's going on here is that imagine it like a cartographer. So a cartographer has a landscape that they're going to make a map of. And the map is not the landscape. It's a different thing. But the map is supposed to depict the landscape. It's trying to highlight certain realities, and we want it to be accurate, like where the uh, topological elevation lines. We want to make sure that that fits right, um, that the proportions of differences are consistent on the scale, right? Maps can be more or less accurate. If you've ever looked at uh, maps from the Enlightenment or um, early modern period, they look pretty wacky. 
um, or even going earlier, like 13th century maps. I mean, there's some parts that they're pretty accurate about, but then other parts they're like, whoa, they totally got that one wrong, right? Um, because the map is supposed to represent the reality of landscapes. The way I think about this, kind of in the lines of sort of like realism from our realism relativism debate last time. I mean, if you think that there's some kind of objectivity to morality, that, that objective truth is out there, that objective truth is like the moral landscape or what I sometimes call like moral phenomenon, that the things we're trying to study. And what a moral theory is, is not the moral reality itself. What a moral theory does is find a way to conceptually, rationally represent that moral reality. It's trying to capture it. And kind of like on this line of think for yourself, you know, look for the good and the bad and all the theories that we're going to be looking at, like be a critical thinker about them. Think about like what parts of the moral landscape do you feel that theory is capturing really accurately? And where might it have some blind spots? Where might it be a distortion that it's it's missing something like a major landmark, like a certain big mountain is there in the moral landscape and it's not showing up in the map. It's not showing up in the theory. Um, Think about them as those sorts of efforts. Now, personal, well, shoot, now I gotta get that back. Personally, I think all three of these major theories that we're gonna be looking at, uh, utilitarianism, Kantian deontology, virtue ethics, all are getting something pretty right. Um, something about the moral landscape they're really savvy to and picking up on and doing a good job representing. I I wouldn't give them to you if I didn't think there was if, if I didn't think there was anything of merit in them at all, I wouldn't rep, I probably wouldn't be teaching them. Um, but I, that's not to say I, I like, I'm personally not a utilitarian. I don't think utilitarianism is right as, as like the final moral answer about things. But I do think there's some things that Mill is sensitive to that is pretty on the money. And, and maybe his way of representing it is not perfectly right. It needs some tweaks or adjustments, or there's other parts of the picture that he's totally not picking up on. Um, but, I want to test it against that. You also might think one of these theories is total crap. That could happen too. You could be totally opposed to something. Um, that can happen. But uh, I was actually talking with one of my colleagues earlier this afternoon. Um, Zoe Alshire is another philosopher in the department. And I asked her, she was like, you should tell your students this thing I'm saying. Um, so I think I will. Um, but she was saying, she she's not a utilitarian either. She actually hates utilitarianism. We're kind of on the same page about that. Um, but she's like, John Stuart Mill is my philosopher boyfriend. She's like, I think he's just a beautiful human being. He's got so many great ideas. His sentiments and character are so awesome. And she's like, and he's kind of handsome too. <laughs> um, I can't speak to that. But um, yeah, he's kind of good looking. You, you can find some images of John Stuart Mill. Anyway, um, th there might be some things that are like, yeah, that's, that's a really good piece of the puzzle, even if other parts are not. Okay, so... I, this moral landscape metaphor, I'll, I'll I'll probably come back to a couple times. I think it's it's helpful for thinking about this um, and recognizing you can get some parts right and some parts really wrong. Um, okay. Yeah. So okay. Another question that you might be curious about for this crash course is why these theories? Why not other ones? And I want to speak to this a few uh, in a few different ways. Let me talk about some of the not the reasons that aren't the case. Um, one is that it's not about the people. Um, I agree with some other contemporary philosophers here who think um, there has been a tendency sometimes in in academic philosophy to treat certain famous philosophers like these great geniuses of history as having more significance and um, taking up more attention than they may deserve that it sort of obscures how there's actually a lot of people working on philosophy at any given moment in history, um, even when it was a more elitist enterprise. Uh, there's a lot of people contributing to philosophy. It's not just about the the people that you end up studying in introductory classes like what we're doing right now. Um, so I agree with that. And I um, even though the sources I'm giving you and the versions of these theories that we're talking about are picking out specific people, John Stuart Mill, Immanuel Kant, Aristotle, very famous figures in philosophy, is not about the people. And I don't think, I mean, people, ideas can't be owned by people. Someone can't invent it. Kant is really explicit about this in his writings. He's like, 
his ultimate moral principle he calls the categorical imperative. And he says, I didn't invent this thing. I can, who, who could invent a moral law, a moral truth? He's like, I'm just describing it. All The only work I think I'm doing is giving a rigorous, philosophical, theoretical description of something that everyone already has. And, he, and Kant really believes everyone already does understand the categorical imperative. You don't have to study Kant in order to know it, that it's already embedded in your mind, and you already think about it and are sensitive to it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it's wrong to think about these as being particular people's ideas. And I think it's dangerous for us to think about our moral values as ours, as associating them with our individual identities. Um, that is definitely something I got to put the hat on for. Um, that's some of my Buddhism speaking there, no self, dangers of attachment, all that kind of stuff. But um, the merits of these ideas shouldn't be linked with the people themselves. I mean, humans are not are never saints. We're never perfect angels. So you're never gonna if you're waiting for that moral theory that's given by a perfect person, like good luck. And I'm even th I'm you know I'm Christian, so I'm like theologically I'm like Jesus was a perfect person. But also, Jesus gives us some moral guidance about things, but he doesn't give a full-fledged out moral theory. In fact, he seems to deliberately avoid giving that for it. So I, if any of you don't care about Christianity, then don't worry about this. But uh, some of you do, I know, care about Christianity. Um, I, I always think it's noteworthy that Jesus speaks in parable and almost never gives you it straight. He's not like, here is my ultimate moral principle. Here is my proof for why it is true. I mean... He just doesn't speak like these philosophers do about it. Um, but if you want to have more theological stuff about that, we can, we can do that. But um, if you're looking for a human that's not God <laughs> to give you some moral insight here uh, and you're waiting for them to be a, a perfect human to do that, like that's just not going to happen. And even if they were perfect, um, that wouldn't be the basis of the authority of their ideas, but rather the ideas themselves and the merits on their own terms. So it's not about the people. I also think it's not about the culture. So um, this is, I'm going to keep my hat slightly tilted for this one. Um, these theories are, uh, the philosophers we're studying are coming from a Western background. So that's definitely true. And um, I have Buddhism on the schedule, but I don't know if we'll get to it, to have some Eastern philosophy in here too. Um, I actually like to use Buddhism after we get through the big three, kind of because of the, the point I'm about to make. Um, these theories are, we're st I'm kind of giving you them from their Western presentations, but just the same way as like a person can't own these ideas, cultures can't own these ideas either, in my opinion. Um, the ideas of Mill, Kant, Aristotle, that we'll be talking about, show up in other cultures. And this is actually a theme that will come up for our international business unit. I talked about cultural relativism is going to come back again. We're going to discuss that later on this quarter. This point will also come up then, too, um, that these aren't Western values, um, even if they became very formative in some of the history of Western civilization and its development, um, especially things like egalitarianism and liberal values and stuff like that. But these ideas show up all over the place. And the arguments and the objections show up all over the place, too. They're just kind of being packaged up with different language and different vocabulary. And it, and it is a little bit of a conscious choice on my part here to give you their Western presentations since we live in a Western country. And ha you get the added benefit of sort of making it easier to connect the dots with how these moral concepts connect with how people talk about morality around us here in America. So there's a little bit of that. But I don't think that these are limited to just Western culture, um, that you can you can see the same debates showing up all across the map. So um, if we do have time, which I'm always a little skeptical of because I know how the schedule gets, um, if we do have time, though, it's fun to do Buddhism after these big three Western moral theories because at various times, um, each of the uh, Western philosophers in trying to understand Buddhism have found parallels with each of those theories. Like when... Um, when the West first really got like more mainstream exposure to Buddhism, the first default was like, oh, this is utilitarianism. And that has really fallen away. It's like, nope, that's a misunderstanding. It's It's got some pretty important differences. There's some things that's on the same page about, but there's some other pretty big differences here. 
And then it was, and this has been more recently, um, oh, it's a virtue ethic. This is like Aristotle's virtue ethics. And I think there's some parallels there too. But for my money, I think Buddhism is most closely connected with Kant. Um, so there, and there's a lot of good reasons to see the parallels there. But just, I mean, the fact that Buddhism isn't a perfect sign up for any one of those stands to reason because like we said moral theories are complicated objects they're not just one thing and they're not monolithic things so that you could have like buddhism is a representation of an ethical paradigm that's got pieces here here and here but those basic pieces those component parts those bits of conceptual technology those are not uh i think confined to cultural um bubbles like like on cultural relativism like these are concepts that reflective people can find and entertain and see the compellingness of um, regardless of which culture they come from culture and and cultural bias is something that we need to ubiquitously have on the map and be guarded against and watching as we're doing this kind of objective truth seeking um, but a big part of what it is to like do philosophy and to be a philosopher is to try to get your thinking outside of the confines of just what you're being given and shown in your immediate time and place and world and culture is to try to think outside of that um, and entertain other possibilities that are bigger than that and that's been part of the heritage of philosophy forever okay made that point so these theories are the reason why we're doing these theories because um, you might think there's just so many moral theories out there so many di so much diversity of moral perspective between humans on the planet and that is true however I would also say A lot of those differences are not fundamental differences. A lot of the diversity is not as broad uh, as it might appear in just thinking about how different everyone's life is. But they kind of get grouped into these basic categories. And these big three theories um, that we're studying here, that we're, we're getting into, I think cover, they don't cover everything. They're not completely exhaustive. I'm sure there's some other, that uh, I actually can think of some that are kind of don't fit in any of them but they cover huge swaths of the moral landscape. They represent like really like tendencies about how to even approach or try to get a handle on this whole moral phenomenon stuff. Um, so a lot of the other diversity happens just within these big categories. So I'm thinking if we study these theories, you're going to get familiarized with a lot of the conceptual technology that would just be relevant for anything that we might speculate about about a moral perspective it gives you a lot of pieces to play with not everything but a lot <laughs> I think these are pretty dense and um, and covering wide swaths of the map of all possible moral perspectives that people could have um, I remember in grad school I tried to put together this is specifically on the why question of morality I try to make a list of like, okay, so how many different options are there for how to justify a moral theory? Like, what could you appeal to as evidence or argument for moral claims? And I was expecting this to kind of be a big task, and I uh, got through it pretty fast. And I was like, there's got to be something more than this. It can't just be these. I think I had, I, I, I was really trying to stretch on some of them. I never, I didn't have more than a dozen. Just a dozen. And even some of those were a stretch to like try to get some more. I mean, there, I think if I remember right, I don't have the list in front of me, but I, I think there were like four or five that seemed like the categories of kinds of judge, um, kinds of justification that covers like almost all of uh, the kind of moral reasoning that we're prone to appealing to conscience, appealing to logic, appealing to culture, appealing to God, like appealing to or, or other authorities. Um, there's just only so many options uh, for how to go with this. Um, so people who have their own little twists and tweaks on things of like, oh, I put this value a little higher priority than this value, but what are the kind of big general ways of approaching understanding what ethics is all about? There's not, I think, that many. And these three will, even if they don't exhaust the whole map, they're going to give you a lot of the pieces. And if you think there's definitely, I, I put this as like a challenge to myself, that you can help me with if you think that there are some really big things that are not on the map uh, that don't get covered by these three theories bring it up I'd really like to um, be I'm definitely open to that possibility to think like 
there's something that should have gotten represented here that didn't get represented, um, I would definitely like to hear about that. We can have some discussion about that. Um, along those lines, there's one thing I'm always kind of struggling with the curriculum here that I wanted to share with you. Um, and we're almost to the end of my caveats, so I, I promise. If this is getting a little tedious, I could understand that. My apologies for that. Um, but I'm, I'm almost done here, and then we'll, we'll take a little break, people in the chat, because uh, we're definitely ready for it. I'm ready for it. I'm hyperventilating. So, uh, But let's, let's push through this last, last little bit. Um, so I mentioned like three plus one sometimes when I've been talking about the ethical theories we're going to look at. And the plus one, so we've got... Utilitarianism, consequentialism, uh, Kantian deontology, and virtue ethics. And the, the fourth one that I always, uh, other than Buddhism, that I, I want to kind of get in is feminist care ethics. And uh, I was actually talking with, with Zoe, my colleague, about this today, too. And she was like, yeah, I understand the dilemma here with this. Because she, she's interested in care ethics, too. I'm very interested in care ethics. Um, but it's a little hard to, to work in. And there's a couple reasons for it. Um, but I had a, a recent revelation too about this. I, I'm gonna I want to share is like an important caveat for what we're gonna do next. Um, it, it it's hard for a couple reasons. One, feminist care ethics is not um, systematic. There's there's not one. I can actually keep my hat like this for this. Um, there's not just one thing it is. There's a lot of disagreement about what it actually is. And there's a lot of different motives about why people are doing it and what they think the significance of it is. Um, I put on the kind of reading list for us uh, this book, uh, In a Different Voice, um, by uh, Gilligan. And uh, it's it's the kind of one of the touchstones that people appeal to for like the start of feminist care, modern feminist care ethics. Um, and it's really taking this stance of all these big three classical moral theories are geared toward masculine identity that they're built around values and virtues that are associated with men and not with women and so it's kind of a reactive work it's like trying to do something different in a different voice is the is the title um and it, it's saying let's build an ethical theory out of those values that are associated with women instead of with men interesting proposal um but that's not how all of it has gone down and there's a question of like, is that an epistemology for an objective universal moral truth too? I mean, this could be something useful as a part of dealing with the asymmetries of our own society. But there's also a question here about whether um, the things that have been appealed to or have been thought about as masculine characteristics really ought to be. And this is where you get <clears throat> some people on the other side who are like, the problem is not getting rid of the values of, of, that have been associated with men. And the moral theories that have been then been that use those values or appeal to those values, the problem is with they're associated with men. That's the problem, not the values, but the association with men is the problem, right? That these are masculine traits, rather than thinking that they can't be traits of women. So um, there is an article. I, if anyone's interested, I can forward it to you. Um, this feminist philosopher, she's, I think she's actually she wrote a book and had some papers, and I think. The thing that I copied and saved because I, I was like, man, that's definitely that I find that argument very compelling was actually an interview. Um, <clears throat> and she was kind of saying things like uh, like sometimes the these more re the more uh, reactive um, version of feminist care ethics like looks at Kant. Right. Kant is all about reason. Everything is about reason and reason is associated with masculinity traditionally, like the kind of gendered identities. Um, and this feminist, she was like. Um, yeah, I don't know why feminist philosophers are tossing Kant in the trash. Like Kant, I found Kant to be crucial. Like Kant's theoretical devices, his bits of conceptual technology for moral reasoning as being crucial for understanding the project of feminism and what we're trying to do here. So, um, I, I, I'm kind of, a, I, I like Kant though too. So, you know, no, mark my biases, <laughs> but I'm, I'm convinced by the arguments. Uh, I guess it's not fair to say bias. Just be on the lookout for it the way I'll try to be on the lookout about it too. I've spent a lot of time with Kant, so that would be maybe a source of bias. Um, but I try to be on guard. You should too. Okay. Um, that's one thing that complicates things. Another thing is that um, care itself seems to require cashing out. Um, just like we were saying on Tuesday with uh, psychological egoism and self-interest. 
that there was remember that argument that was like um if you're going to be self-interested you you can't just care about yourself you have to care about something that's not you in order to be able to flesh out any substantive vision of what self-interest looks like or what actions would be in your self-interest um, the same thing happens with care if we're going to define care caring for others what does it mean to care um, what is caring and that would depend on appealing to other values to be able to cash that out so in some ways i when i've done my own work with care ethics i'm like yeah if i want to put the emphasis here on care i'm still going to need these other moral theories or some moral theory to get to put some flesh on that um there's also an emphasis on intuition and emotion that is sometimes the thing but you're kind of getting the sense here that different feminist care ethicists like take this in very different directions and the final thing that is somewhat complicating about this and, and I think does kind of prevent some systematicity is that sometimes in my experience in my experience with studying this stuff feminist care ethics doesn't always uh, have as robust of a meta ethical view of the justification of a moral theory now that's a evaluation on my part so that's just you know my Yelp review or something but I've always felt like um, that's another thing that care ethics can really use from some of these other approaches is like well what kind of epistemology do you want to have for this what way of justifying this picture is appropriate um, that really does shoulder the burden of proof about it other than just saying something like gender inequality is bad and unjust yeah and the, the question would be like well a moral theory should be able to tell us why that's the case not just say that it's the case but why that be able to justify why and I actually think you're gonna get a lot of good arguments for why that would be something so problematic um, from these traditional theories uh, going all the way back to Aristotle ancient Greece and Aristotle is a misogynist I mean I'm we'll talk about that later I have no apologizing for Aristotle he should know better his uh, teacher Plato was saying we should have women as philosopher queens controlling us so <laughs> he doesn't have any excuses for saying he never was exposed to these ideas um, okay so <clears throat> final thing to wrap up care ethics um, we may run out of time it's hard to do kind of a more systematic presentation on it the way I can do with these other three theories however and this was the big res re realization that I had recently um, in preparing for this class uh, before the quarter started I realized because I was always like kicking myself I'm like man I should really do more care ethics it never seems to happen you know kind of feeling like that should really happen and then I realized oh man the way that I teach the classical three theories is definitely and I think maybe pretty strongly within the lens or the framing of care ethics that you're gonna hear me bring in a lot of talk about care in describing these theories and I don't think I'm just projecting it onto it like kind of anachronistically I think it's there to be found I actually think one of the maybe the best arguments in favor of care ethics is how universal it really is how care is a fundamental value that's a part of all of these different moral attempts that we could make that it's kind of a, um, a common denominator of sorts that there's no way to have a moral theory without talking about care and so what we need to do is just emphasize that or just acknowledge that and um, and maybe give it a more privileged position in how we cash these things out but um, yeah and the debate I was having with my colleague this afternoon another thought came up and I was like yeah I think this is right these these theories from Kant Mill and Aristotle they have definitely been used for rationalization purposes for people doing actions that are not very great just a quick example utilitarianism John Stuart Mill 19th century he's a member of Parliament and a philosopher so he doesn't just talk the talk he walks the talk he's inter he's very involved in society and he is totally opposed to slavery he's trying to promote women's suffrage their right to vote uh, and working for um, workers to own the land that they work on so kind of land rights for for uh, laborers um, pretty progressive stuff but in his own time with his own theory people tried to justify slavery using utilitarian arguments so mill he's creating utilitarianism uh and 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 or he's creating a version of it and arguing very strongly for it and trying to basically 
um, evangelize it to people and be like, hey, we need to be concerned about morality in, I think, a really different way than we've been doing it traditionally. Um, and he's totally opposed to slavery, and his own thing gets used totally contrary to that purpose. That's happened. Moral theories get abused. They get twisted for rationalization purposes rather than sincere moral regard. That happens. And one thing I think is kind of cool about care ethics is that I think part of its power might be to help protect and guard against those misuses of those theories. But those theories in taken in their like intended use and with the arguments that are actually behind them and not distorting any of the points that they're making are definitely all of them in each category I think deeply committed to a value of care and the kind of thing that these feminists are really trying to um, emphasize in their work uh, today. So um, kind of what you can expect here, and I wanted to be explicit about it in a heads up sort of way, is that even though we're going to be studying some of this stuff, I'm going to be, of uh, these other theories, I'm going to be importing quite a lot of care ethics into it. And I'll try to note that when it's happening, when it's like really strong. Um, but like I said, I don't think I'm just projecting it. I think it's there to be found in those theories. All of them are pretty idealistic. Um, all of them set the moral bar pretty darn high, and I think are compassionate. And we'll we'll talk about that as it, as it happens. Okay, um, chat, how you doing? I have not seen people really jumping in uh, and interrupting with any questions or anything. Um, but uh, if there is stuff that's happening, um, let's take a break. Feel free to like drop some questions down. I'm gonna step away for a second here. And I'll come back. Maybe I can answer some questions that you have. And that, and again, I think that's a service to everyone who's watching this later too, who doesn't get the chance to ask questions. You're kind of the representatives of the class here. So if some, if you're confused by something, definitely someone else is too. That'd be my bet. I'd put money on it. Um, so don't be uh, shy about that. Okay, I'll um, see you in a little bit. All right, we're back. Um, couple little hanging threads before I get into utilitarianism proper here. First one, one final thing about care ethics that I forgot to mention. And it's kind of implicit, but I want to make it explicit. Uh, another thing that sort of distinguishes care ethics and is something you're going to see me talking about a lot as I talk through these other three theories. This is that point I was making about how I sort of integrate care ethics into my treatment and presentation of these uh, traditional theories, these big three from, from Western moral philosophy. Um, and that's the emphasis that care ethics has on relationships. And specifically, of course, you might guess, caring relationships and their kind of moral primacy. And I think that is present here. Um, I think the versions of these theories that are treated more impersonally or that are not as sensitive to the kinds of relationships that we have with each other uh, are really the distorted versions of these that get used to rationalize bullshit, to put it bluntly. Um, I think that this is probably the main point or substance behind what I was saying earlier about how I think care is embedded in them is I think all of them are really talking about the shape and character and depth and substance of caring relationships between people and caring relationships with the relationship you have with yourself too. Um, they provide a lot of the raw material for understanding the, the meaning of those things. And they are going to be presenting different visions about that. And that, I think that's part of why you see so much diversity among care ethicists, is that people have a lot of different ideas of what a caring relationship uh, looks like or ought to look like. So that, that's another theme that will come up here as we keep going. And then finally, the other uh, hanging thread here is just a more of a um, procedural point. Um, we had a lot of people missing in class on Tuesday. Um, pretty good number of people. And I've been trying to be in contact with those of you who, who, weren't, who weren't there on Tuesday. Um, if I forgot to give anyone an excused absence, let me know. In case you're wondering whether you have excused or unexcused absences in the gradebook, what you'll see for a unexcused absence is a zero. And what you'll see for an excused absence is a, a dash, like a hyphen. And what that means is it's sort of just dropped from the score. So it doesn't add positive credit to your score, but it also doesn't take away from your score for attendance either. So if I missed any of those, if we talked about it and there was some excused absence and I didn't catch that in the grade book, definitely let me know. I do give excused absences. Um, that's, that's part of my attendance policy. But also, 
Um, I've been talking with a bunch of you that weren't there on Tuesday, and I think Tuesday's lecture was pretty important. Um, I think it covered a lot of really important territory, uh, framing the entire rest of the class. Uh, I did try to get in the material here about uh, the three types of normative claims. So you, you got that part from Tuesday. That was one of the things we did. But most of Tuesday was spent talking about uh, relativism and the nature of objective moral truth, period. And I've been trying to uh, set up ways in which I can catch up those of you who missed that we've been talking. And I, I want to, so far, a lot of the attempts have fallen through so far. I haven't been able to have those conversations with a lot of you. Um, and maybe some of you I, I haven't touched base with about it yet, uh, but that is um, pretty important, I think. I'd like, I, I want it to be a priority for us to try to catch you up on at least a sketch of that material. Um, I think it would be valuable. Uh, I was kind of sad of, uh, to miss a day like that one. Um, so let me know. Be in touch with me. I'm always happy to talk to you and help you catch up on things, whether it's excused or unexcused absences. I, I just want you to get the best experience you can with this class, and I'm going to do everything I can to, to assist in that. Okay, so let's get into utilitarianism. Um, it's sort of weird the order in which I'm going to do these. We're actually going to go backwards in history. Um, utilitar John Stuart Mill is the most recent of the three that we're going to be looking at. Um, and like I said, I'm not too concerned about talking about him as a person. Um, he didn't invent utilitarianism either. Utilitarianism, like I was saying, is just like a broad approach about how people might think about moral matters, the, how to start analyzing this moral landscape, or what angle to approach that from. Um, and Mill himself says, if, you, if you've been looking at the optional reading, he's like, yeah, I didn't invent, utilitarianism is a really old idea. The name is new in the 19th century, like this title, utilitarianism, but the basic idea and inspiration of it has been around since ancient philosophy. So uh, it's not it's not limited to just him. Mill is kind of an interesting character. I, I think uh, like like my colleague was calling him her philosopher boyfriend, <laughs> even though she disagrees with his theory. Um, he he's he's noteworthy in a couple respects. I think he is largely uh, uh, I, I think he's a very sincere person. I also for a theory like utilitarianism, I think it's funny to say that um, I think of Mill is really a big hippie, and utilitarianism isn't usually the theory you'd associate with hippies it's uh more based on its kind of um uh stereotype or cartoon version of it it's kind of like the bean counter ethic <laughs> uh where people are worried that maybe these moral values are being reduced in some sort of way but the way that mill talks about it and how he argues for it and how he cashes it what it means to cashes out what it means to be utilitarian very very hippie-ish and i will talk about that um as we go forward but and it's also noteworthy about Mill that he's he's one of these philosophers who isn't just writing from the ivory tower of academia or in a cave somewhere with his insights and wisdom, but he's really engaged with the world and trying to walk that talk. I think that's kind of cool too. But utilitarianism doesn't come down to John Stuart Mill and what you think of that person. The ideas themselves are the interesting part. The reason why we're getting John Stuart Mill's version and why I'm, I'm like focused on teaching you that version of utilitarianism is that it is kind of the major touchstone for all other variations, modern versions of utilitarianism. Mill made some adjustments to it or added some bits of conceptual and theoretical technology to the approach that has uh, proven to be pretty instrumental and useful, not only for the theory defending itself against certain objections, but just making it into a more robust, more powerful moral theory. Um, one that has a better chance of shouldering this burden of proof of being a truly universal theory. Um, one other thing I think that is worth mentioning about Mill's uh, approach to all of this, and something I think that's motivating his efforts in giving a theoretical articulation, making this map, this utilitarian map of the moral landscape, is he is extremely sensitive to this concern about arbitrary projection of value based on bias and contingency. Um, Mill, I don't think, is approaching it like, well, these are my values and I want to recommend them to you. But he's really designing the theory in many ways to reflect how we just morally reason. He's not like, this isn't how I think. He's like, this is how we think. <laughs> like, everyone. Um, so he could still be not getting an accurate view of how everyone thinks. But 
we'll see this as it goes especially um, the my plan for lecturing on utilitarianism and presenting it to you is to first talk about the what's and I think that's what we can accomplish tonight but then next time when we get together on Tuesday I'll, I'll want to start talking about the why's what are the arguments that justify the theory and throughout this whole unit the why's are the things I really want to make sure you got a robust grasp on because it's you know moral codes are a dime a dozen but a moral theory is going to be shouldering burden of proof and making argument about it. why should you buy this theory versus all the other ones that are on offer. Um, okay, so getting into it. What is utilitarianism? Um, another reason I'm starting with this theory is that it's one of the simplest to understand in terms of what its proposal is. It's supremely elegant. It is so elegant. And I'm, and this, I'm saying this as someone who doesn't really buy into it. Um, it's very, very powerful in the sense that with just one moral principle, because utilitarianism is just one moral principle, that's it, one rule, only one. With that one rule, it's able to provide a robust theoretical guidance for how you make any decision under any circumstances. So a lot of times moral theories have like vague values or principles that you're like, uh, how does this apply? How does this translate into this situation? What if things are like this? I don't know. But with utilitarianism, there's a very straightforward procedure, straightforward theoretically. Practically, it gets a little messy, but it's a straightforward theoretical roadmap for how you tackle the tough issues that show up in ethics, in moral reasoning. The execution on that is not going to necessarily be easy, but it's like with utilitarianism, you always know what it's going to come down to. There's no ambiguity about the standards of evaluation for whether an action is right or wrong. Um, and that's that's what makes it so powerful. And I think the people that like it, this is definitely a big feather in the cap that they point to about the theory. And um, so uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. So what is it? Um, the first thing we should talk about about defining utilitarianism is that it's a species of a broader category of moral theories called consequentialist theories. Now utilitarianism is definitely the most famous and probably most robustly developed version of consequentialism, um, but there are others out there. Um, but what, what do consequentialists believe? Consequentialists believe that right and wrong, the stuff that's germane to this category of normative claims that I was talking about is moral status, right? What matters of moral responsibility. That if you're having questions about how should you act, how should you use the power that you have, how should you steward those things you have control over, what's the right thing to do with that freedom or power that you have, um, consequentialists say all those questions about right and wrong derive from issues of what's good and bad. Now that may not sound so crazy, but this is in contrast with a lot of other moral approaches, including the other theories we're going to talk about. Um, what the consequentialist is saying is, if you want to figure out what's right and wrong, right and wrong is just a derivative of good and bad. First, you got to figure out what are the good things and what are the bad things. And then you figure out what to do based on what course of action is going to do the most good and the least bad. That's going to cause the most good consequences and avoid causing bad consequences. That's what right and wrong, that's what morality comes down to. Now I want to kind of, maybe it'll be helpful here for me to distinguish how good and bad is different from right and wrong because it very much is. Um, good and bad uh, doesn't necessarily connect with something like a will. Like we were talking earlier about the genetic predisposition for alcoholism. Bad, but it's not immoral. If an airplane explodes because of some faulty wiring and everyone dies, we're like, it's bad. But the airplane is not immoral, right? So bad, good and bad things happen without any morality involved with them. But what consequentialism is saying is in that realm of morality, for the kinds of beings that are subject to moral choices that can do things that are right or wrong, if you're trying to figure out how to make that choice, think about what's good and bad. And there isn't any parameters or rules for what's right and wrong other than those that are built on concern about the good and concern about the bad, good and bad consequences. Okay, so 
Other theories disagree about this. Most notably, we could talk about Kant, which we're going to do next. Kant thinks like, and, and a lot of people have this kind of way of thinking about morality that talks about morality in terms of obligations and duties. So like uh, if you believe in hum human rights, human rights are saying here are these obligations that you have toward other people that basically make certain behaviors off limits. Like you can't torture people, you cannot kill people, you cannot blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing, right? Those actions are never right um, because <clears throat> we have obligations against it. Or think about like making a promise. If you make a promise, now you're obligated to fulfill the promise, not break the promise, right? That's a way of thinking about morality that's not necessarily talking about good and bad consequences. Um, unless you're thinking about rights as being justified on utilitarian grounds or consequentialist grounds or something like that. Um, but uh, there are other ways to approach this. And you can imagine, like, um, you can't violate human rights no matter how much good it would cause. No matter how many good consequences would come out of violating human rights, the people that are thinking in this sort of more Kantian way about it are like, no, that's never okay. It's never morally right to do that. Whereas for the consequentialists, they're like, if it does the most good, that's the thing that's morally right. And there aren't any considerations here for what's right and wrong other than the good and bad consequences. So it's, it's a little bit of a major move to be a consequentialist. And this is one of the first things that kind of defines the moral shape of the utilitarian theory, that it's running this kind of thing. What makes utilitarianism a species of consequentialism is that utilitarianism is going a little bit more in cashing out what are the good and bad consequences. So if consequentialism is saying all right and wrong derives from good and bad, the next question is like, okay, what's good and what's bad? What are the good and bad consequences? There are plenty of consequences of our actions that, or things that happen in the world that are kind of neither good nor bad. They're kind of neutral. They don't, they're not morally relevant. They don't really matter. And, uh, but which ones are which, right? Which are the ones that we should be tracking? Which are the ones we shouldn't? Utilitarianism says the only consequences that matter here for morality, the only things that count as something being good or bad is utility. And what utility is as a phenomenon is the next thing we need to describe. So um, Mill is not the first person to think about utilitarianism, and he's not even the first person to use the word utilitarianism. In the generation right before him, there's this philosopher named Jeremy Bentham. Um, I talked about the history with my other class earlier today, but maybe we don't need to go too much into the history. It was a little bit of a tangent. Um, but just really quickly, Bentham is he's a part of the Enlightenment, the early modern movement. And if you if you know your history a little bit here, you know that part one of the big things about the Enlightenment was the scientific revolution. Um, science just like blew open, like the gate, the floodgates were opened. And the real triggering thing for it was calculus, some major developments in calculus and um, algebraic geometry. So it was math that really opened the way for what we would recognize like in a contemporary setting as like science and the scientific method. Before that, you had science kind of under the moniker of natural philosophy. In fact, um, <clears throat> Newton, very famous scientist, he doesn't think of himself as a scientist as much as just a natural philosopher. And if you read his Principia, uh, where he lays down these like formalized um, natural laws, Newton's laws, it really reads like a work of metaphysics rather than something out of like a scientific journal today. You, it's, it's, the rhetoric would be kind of unfamiliar to a modern scientific audience. Um, and it'd be much more familiar to like a philosopher who studies this, the, these historical theories. Um, but anyway, this kicked off like Newton couldn't have done what he did without calculus. Calculus was the breakthrough here in algebraic geometry. Being able to use algebra to describe geometrical relationships like things that are happening in space, like forces and vectors and stuff like that. So that was a pretty big deal. It kicked off this intellectual fad of sorts called applied mathematics, where people are like, ooh, well, if math can do all this awesome stuff for physics, maybe it can solve some other problems. And Jeremy Bentham was like, maybe math can solve ethics and morality. And so he designs a theory to do this, and, that, and he calls it utilitarianism. Um, there's a calculus involved in utilitarianism. We'll get to that in a second. But for Bentham, this variable of utility 
ha because of his interest in doing this kind of pseudoscientific thing with applied mathematics, it's not pure science here. This is this is ethics. It's normative theory. But he he needs something to be able to measure, like creating most good consequences, least bad consequences. You need to be able to quantify that somehow. So he um, speaks about utility as just a kind of thing that would be like an empirical phenomenon that could be quantified. And he lands on pain and pleasure. So the kind of classic values of hedonists. Uh, hedonism has been is part of the heritage of utilitarianism historically. And hedonism is the one that's saying like pleasure and avoidance of pain is like the ultimate good of life. Okay. Now I, I can already imagine some of the criticisms you might have here of like if utilitarianism is just hedonism, well hedonism is stupid hang on to your hat mill has a lot of things to say about this and it's actually on this point that we're talking about right now so bentham is looking though for so let's hang on to that let's stick a little pin in that bentham is looking for something that can be empirically quantifiable like sensations um, even though they're tricky to quantify they have clear quantity variables connected with them um, and bentham has a list of seven of these um, and actually i'm I kind of like having my face up here, the video. I think it's easier to listen to someone. You can see their face. But I do have uh, my lecture notes. These are up on Canvas. You can check them out. Um, and I'm I'm not going to be doing everything here because this is designed for a class where we're not doing this as a crash course. But uh, I'll, I'll bring it up here for a couple things, like right here. So when Bentham is talking about utility as happiness, as pleasure, and the absence of pain, he's wanting to be able to measure this stuff, at least in a kind of mathematical metaphorical way even if it's difficult like there's a unit of measurement here um i think it, the you people used to call it a hedon in reference to hedonism like one unit of hedons uh or uh now people talk about utils in reference to utilitarianism what exactly one util is i i don't know is it like one chocolate chip cookie or something i don't know um one util of pleasure or a util's worth of pain i, I don't know but with despite those like measurement issues what is clear are the kinds of empirical variables that could affect the calculus here um, all the things that Bentham appeals to are things that we could at least theoretically define in a way where we recognize uh, an amount of more and amount of less so for example thinking about pleasures or pains like how intense they are like I know there's a difference between scratching my finger and cutting off my arm like those are going to be different or having a chocolate chip cookie or shooting up a bunch of heroin like those they're just the intensity there's a difference there of an amount certainty is like the probability of it happening if i if i do a certain action how likely will this consequence occur it's not always a hundred percent or zero right there can be in between that's going to affect the calculus um purity is is a weirder one this is a matter of whether um the pain or pleasure is mixed with other pains or pleasures. So Bentham thinks um, I'd rather have one big pleasure than a bunch of little pleasures that all add up to it. I'd prefer a bunch of little pains rather than one big pain, things like that. Um, oops, uh, here we go. Oh, what just happened? There we go. Um, extent is like how many people are affected by this consequence, how many people are feeling that pain or pleasure. Uh, duration is how long it lasts for. Proximity is how far off into the future is it. I always like to joke, I bet you wouldn't expect a moral philosopher to tell you that delayed gratification actually is worth less than immediate gratification. That's exactly what Bentham says. Uh, he thinks there's going to be a higher weight to the utility in its quantity if it's happening sooner rather than later. Um, and the pains are less weighty if they're put off into the future. Um, they, that doesn't affect the other variables, of course. So even if it is far away proximity-wise, the pain or pleasure could be so intense or so certain or affect so many people that it'd be worth it, right? But the, this is just another variable that affects things. I think the best uh, charitable effort I can give to Bentham here is that um, if something's happening immediately, you kind of know it's going to happen, whereas if it's way off into the future, there's other there's room for other events to like change the course of how things are going um, from this one action that you did right now. So there's kind of more opportunities for either the pleasure to end up not happening or the pain to not happen, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, and then um, fecundity is also kind of a goofy one. Um, 
Fecundity is like how the painter having that pain or pleasure opens the door or leads the way or paves the way for other pains and pleasures. So like, um, I like talking about shooting up heroin here because it's just kind of funny. Uh, and it actually does, it scores pretty well on some of these variables, especially intensity and certainty. Um, but, and this is kind of one of the big kickers against why utilitarianism is not telling you to shoot up heroin, because it is not telling you to shoot up heroin, is uh, if you get the pleasures of heroin use, um, you also are going to set yourself up for all the pains of withdrawal and the inability to experience other pleasures. Those are major problems. Um, about why it will never make sense, it will never maximize utility to uh, shoot heroin. Okay, but I'm, we're, what we're talking about here is defining what is utility. And for Bentham, it's really this uh, phenomenon of sensations of pain and pleasure. Now, if you take a look at the Mill reading, you'll find Mill also uses the language of pain and pleasure, but he is changing up the theory so much from how Bentham is doing it that a lot of modern utilitarians are like. Mill isn't really talking about pain or pleasure anymore. That's not the phenomenon that he's defining utility in terms of. Um, he's stretching the words of pain and pleasure so far that we're not just talking about sensations anymore. And part of this is because um, Mill is concerned about the objections of hedonism, that utilitarianism is just hedonistic, and hedonism is insensitive to other values that we think of as pretty important and should be factored into a moral analysis. Um, the three big ones are um, positive caring human relationships, which Mill is very savvy to, which is why I think care makes sense as a part of utilitarianism, um, education and knowledge, and freedom. Freedom's a really big deal for Mill. He wrote a whole book called On Liberty, that's really interesting. Um, he's got some very interesting things to say about liberty. He's a very big defender of um, freedom as this like very important moral value. But he's not building his theory around it. He's building his theory around pain and pleasure. And all three of these things have been have been appealed to as like things that we think of as really, really valuable and important as providing meaning of life, which a utilitarian theory like Bentham's that's only tracking these quantity variables of sensations of pain and pleasure doesn't seem like it's going to be able to protect that in the calculus of imagining my different options, there's going to be a lot of cases in which values like positive loving human relationships, uh, knowledge and truth and education, and freedom are going to be sacrificed for the sake of pleasure or avoidance of pain. And we have some intuitions that say that's not right. And Mill's way of getting around this, these objections is to utilitarianism is not to disagree with them. He's actually to agree with them. He's like, I think you're exactly right. Um, let, let me do a little demonstration, though, of what, why these objections are so concerning or why they, why they attach to Bentham's version of utilitarianism. Um, so let's say, uh, like right now, I've got a lot of freedoms, right? Um, but it's not like I'm I'm overcome with waves of ecstasy because of like, oh, I'm so free right now. It feels so good, right? The sensations are not very intense. You know, they're, they're just, they don't weigh very much on these quantity variables. And yet I think they're really important. And the things that do give me lots of pleasure or the pains that I'm looking to avoid, um, they might cut in the way of of wanting to my I might sacrifice my freedom for it. Like one of the really terrible arguments that was offered, like that's a utilitarian type of argument. I was talking I was referencing earlier trying to rationalize slavery historically, was like, oh man, it's great to be a slave. Right? You don't have to worry about your room and board. Um don't have to deal with all these tough choices that it had when you have freedom. It's like it causes anxiety. I definitely, uh, that's, I think that's a terrible argument for slavery. That's really not so bad because look at all the pain pleasure considerations, these consequences things. So it's not a big deal to lose your freedom, right? That's a terrible, terrible argument. And Mill thinks so too. That's why he's so opposed to slavery too. Uh, and why he thinks liberty is such an important value to be prioritized. Um, but not fundamentally. Um, it's not the core theory. Um, and I, I actually, when I was reflecting on this earlier today, I was thinking like, yeah, I've actually met quite a few people <clears throat> today that are like, yeah, I don't know about this whole freedom thing. Like, 
or maybe they don't even talk about it explicitly, but it's like, I think there's some people kind of wish they had less autonomy, that they would actually be more comfortable just having someone tell them what to do. Like, um, you have to decide what major, what career you want to have, this kind of thing. It's like pretty anxiety provoking or like, what are you going to be in this world and everything? If you're like, life would be a lot similar if the government was just like, do this, this is your job. And you're like, okay, know what to do. Don't have to worry about it. But Mel thinks this is this wouldn't be the uh, actual ideal thing. A lot of uh, utilitarianism, more than any other theory, is like the major punching bag for dystopian science fiction novels. Like almost every dystopian science fiction novel is premising a society on utilitarian principles and being like, look how fucked up this gets. But it, usually, it's not a real robust presentation of utilitarianism. It's something more like brute hedonism. Like I don't know if you've ever read Brave New World or something like that. Uh, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, all of these things are like dystopian visions of hedonism um, and uh, maximizing utility overall and sacrificing all these other values. Mill is like, that's not what I'm trying to defend. Mm -mm, not at all. I agree. Sacrificing those values would be wrong. This is another instance of him trying to design a moral theory that just sort of reflects back to us how we morally reason. So he's like, that can't be it. Even pains and pleasures that don't have high quantity may have high quality. So Mill throws a new variable into the utilitarian calculus here when we're trying to weigh the amounts of good and bad consequences. Mill thinks even pretty low intensity pleasures could have really high quality and thus they're going to weigh more in deciding what to do. Now, I've gotten a little bit of ahead of myself, and I, I know it's past 9.30 here, and I guess in my recorded video lecture, I'm only at an hour and 40 minutes here. I, I do want to kind of get some more content out here, and uh, so I want to kind of finish up this last little bit of things before I wrap up for tonight. If any of you have to leave, I'll totally understand. I know it's getting late, um, but I, I want to get a little more content in this video before I wrap it up. Um, I've been getting a little ahead of myself, and I haven't talked to you yet about what that supreme moral principle of utilitarianism is. And that, uh, like I said, there's only one, the principle of utility. And the, the one we're going to be going with here is Mill's version. Whenever you act, always act in such a way that the results of your actions maximize utility. So maxim the, the command to maximize utility is the supreme moral law. It's not ten commandments, there's one commandment in utilitarianism. Just one. Um, I, I Yes, Victoria, I'm going to give you an example of utilitarianism uh, very soon here. That's actually what I wanted to do right now, is like describe this principle and then show how you apply it in making life decisions. Um, but we can't do that without knowing what utility is, but we just kind of talked about that. So Bentham talks about his pain and pleasure, but Mill's stretching this a little bit and saying it's not just about sensations of pain and pleasure, but what it's really about is what some modern utilitarians call preference satisfaction. And even though Mill doesn't use this language, a lot of modern utilitarians are like, that's what Mill's really talking about. But if you look at what he says, how he argues for it, this is where he's really going. And preference satisfaction is basically getting what you want and not getting what you don't want. So if I have desires for things, when my desires are met, boom, my preferences are satisfied. If I don't get what I want, or I get what I don't want, that is preference dissatisfaction, and that would be disutility. So preference satisfaction, positive utility in the calculus. Preference dissatisfaction is negative utility. Okay. So um, here's how it would actually look if I was going to use the principle of utility. And along the way here, I'm going to talk about what are some of the practical difficulties, too. So if I have a choice to make, I'm in a situation. I'm like, what should I do? Step one, I have to think about all my options. And this is where the first difficulty comes in of, of ways in which we very rarely, if ever, actually maximize utility. But what we're supposed to do is do the best that we can. But the first limitation is really limited imagination. Sometimes we don't consider all the options. There's another option out there, and no one's just thought of it yet, so we're not considering it. And maybe that is the option that would maximize utility, but because I'm not thinking about it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't get factored in. It's not a part of my moral reasoning. Um, 
I would say that for this reason, there's always going to be a moral imperative for utilitarians to kind of do their due diligence here in as much as they have the resources to do it. That you always want to be thinking outside the box or looking for other options, other alternatives here. Um, but that would be the first thing, would be in order to follow the principle of utility, I need to first consider what my options are. Then I need to go through them one by one and anticipate what happens if I do that option. And that includes things like probabilistic results, right? They're not necessarily going to happen, but there's a risk of them. What is that probability? Got to figure that out too. Um, and the consequences that matter are utility. So I think about for the mill version, if I do this action, how does that affect people's preferences? Does it give them what they want or does it give them what they don't want? Or does it fail to give them what they want or give them what they positively don't want, right? Like all those different options. I need to be thinking about that. And I use the variables of quantity from Bentham. That's a part of the theory, but it's also added with this notion of quality, which we have more to talk about. Um, so I, I anticipate all those consequences and kind of measure them using the utilitarian calculus here. And then I need to kind of sum them up. And whatever option generates the most net utility, that's the thing I'm supposed to do. That's the right choice and all the other options be Sorry, my hard drive ran out of space again. Um, so uh, finishing this up, uh, my train of thought, I was talking about how you do the utilitarian calculus. Uh, you're weighing up all these things, going with the most net utility here. And that's the thing that you're supposed to do. So the other big limitation that we've got about how we might not actually maximize utility is going to come down to how we don't always anticipate all the consequences. We don't know everything about how the world works causally. And so, again, we just kind of have to do the best we can. But it also encourages, like, if you're trying to be the best utilitarian that you can, you really do have to think about learning more about the world. Like, doing science now has some, like, big moral relevance or understanding people. Um, this is also where I have the, like, care ethics in the background. That um, if I need to care – so when the principle of utility says to maximize utility, it's maximize utility for everybody. Utilitarianism is an egalitarian theory. Mill says everyone is equally deserving of happiness. Everyone's equally deserving of utility. So I can't pick and choose which people I care about here. I have to think about the consequences attached to everyone alike. Even though people will be affected in different ways, and those will be different amounts, um, it still is going to be uh, um, that everyone has sort of the same basic moral worth the same basic deservedness of care and concern. And so if I want to be a really good utilitarian, I need to think about what's happening with other people and where they're at. What are their preferences for things, not what my preferences are for things. So I need to know about them. I need to be interested in them. I need to try to understand them. If someone comes from a different culture I don't have a frame of reference for, I can't assume that they're going to have preferences like mine. I need to find out about that. I need to learn about where, where are they at. What's their situation? Utilitarianism at the outset does not make choices about what preference. Uh, some people have to go. So um, code word for tonight is bunny bedtime. It's a silly game my toddler plays, bunny bedtime. So that's our code word for tonight. Um, okay, so we have to be concerned about each other in order to be good utilitarians here. Um, that would be a pretty high priority. So... Um, that here's an example of like a classic utilitarian situation um if you were gonna have a pizza party and you're trying to decide what pizzas to get you like ask people you're like what do you want what do you want like how much does that matter would you eat it if if it was just like no i don't want to i would not eat any of that pizza if it was on it versus like eh, it's not my first choice but that's fine with me because you're kind of getting a sense of what people's preferences are and how big of a priority, how much are they impacted by this choice versus that choice versus this choice. Um, and you try to basically get as much people as happy as possible. And it might be that there's some uh, condition that attaches to just one person. Like if we put this pizza topping on, they have an allergy to it. They either have to choose between going into anaphylactic shock from eating it or going hungry. And it'd be like, just because one person has that going on, that wouldn't justify not getting that pizza. That there's other things that we can choose that would maximize utility uh, overall here, right? We don't have to, even if some even if some person's like, that's my favorite topping, I would get the most enjoyment out of eating that pizza. 
they're like, but I get what's going on over here. And that's a way bigger utility consideration than the joy, the pleasure I would get out of eating my favorite topping. It just doesn't hold a candle, right? Um, so that would be like a, a pretty simple case, but where utilitarianism definitely is an action. And we have pretty strong intuitions that that's the right way to approach a choice like that. Um, one thing that's sort of weird, I was mentioning earlier, like Mill's already anticipating all the haters out there um, when he's writing this, this work, utilitarianism. And you got to remember, at his time, this is sort of new and really cuts against people's intuitions and dominant culture and tradition, all that kind of stuff, to a certain extent. Um, it's definitely at least in contrast to today. Today, utilitarianism is a ubiquitous concept, and it's filtered into our culture. It's fi filtered into your conscience um, and how you were raised and what you end up thinking about, this kind of doing the most good for the most people, and that we need to be concerned about not just people in our local tribe, but everyone that could be affected. Um, in many ways, Mill's uh, version of utilitarianism, because there's an objection here that goes like, uh, well, you can't think about everyone on the planet. That's too much. How could you ever make any decisions? And Mill's like, well, you don't have to really worry about everyone on the planet in the extent that in most cases, except in the cases that it does matter, most of your actions have consequences with the immediate surroundings. And then it's kind of a ripple effect going further out. So uh, Mill's kind of like the original person who champions the mantra, think globally, act locally, that kind of thing. So that gives you a picture of utilitarianism uh, in a nutshell. Um, thinking about all the options that you've got, weighing their consequences, how does it affect everyone? You're not just maximizing your own utility, you're maximizing utility for everybody. And then um, uh, going with the option that generates the most net utility. Couple other side points here. Um, one, the right option might be a negative number. You know, it might be that it's the least bad, right? That, so that's how maximizing utility could turn out. You might be in a rock and a hard place. There's no good choices. There's nothing. Hard drive ran out again, but I'm back. Let's just finish this off. The other really big point I want to emphasize before we break for tonight is that one of the other distortions of utilitarianism that's used to rationalize all sorts of terrible shit is that utilitarianism is not saying if the good outweighs the bad, the action is permissible. There's a lot of times people try to force hard choices when there's no need for it. That's why the imagination thing is so important. Utilitarianism is instructing you to go with the option that maximizes utility. So even if you've got a course of action that does more good than harm, if there's another option that does more good with less harm, that's the one that's really the right thing to do. So there's no like, eh, it's good enough or something. Um, so those are really defining things about utilitarianism. Uh, it's very uh, selfless in many cases because there's going to be so many circumstances in which your maximizing your utility is not what's going to maximize overall utility. And so there's lots of affordances for cases in which some kind of sacrifice to your own happiness is needed to do what's morally right by everybody. So it is that's part of why it's like a kind of hippie thing. Um, uh, and 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 it's like oh, I was saying earlier before I got cut off, like it's been popularized so much, right? Like utilitarianism is filtered into popular consciousness. I'm a big Star Trek fan. Anyone who likes Star Trek out there might know the Vulcan proverb: um, "The good of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one." And that is just straight up utilitarianism right there. Um, that is a statement of utilitarianism. And and Star Trek plays with this a little bit. That there's like a real moral debate about it, like. When does the one matter more? Um, or there's certain things that shouldn't be done, even though it would be for the greater good. Um, so that's part of the debate we're going to get into as we explore this more. Um, I've got some more things to cash out with Mill's notion of quality, and we definitely have a lot of things to say about how this is all going to get justified. But we'll pick that up on Tuesday. Thanks for watching the video. Uh, code word again, bunny bedtime. That's what I want you to put in the quiz. Thank you for your patience, people in the chat, with all my technical difficulties tonight. Um, and for how uh, late it is for getting this all done. But um, there it is. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again all next week. And people that missed stuff before, don't be shy about getting in contact with me to catch up. Um, code word is bunny bedtime. Okay. Um, see ya until next time.